my hope and my, my word is always up to local residences. If you see anything that says we need your feedback on things, whether it's to do with our local board, your schools, um, our Auckland plan, as boring as it may sound, like give time to it because it's going to impact you, it's going to impact your children, it's going to impact infrastructure, it's going to impact your life. It really is. This podcast is proudly supported by the Ōtara Network Action Committee, ONAC, community-owned, community-driven and community-led. Kia ora mai tato, ko Judy Spatterho, and this week I'm back with a brand new mini-series in our We Are Ōtara series of our local leaders and local people telling their stories. Our mini-series is called Local Leaders, and we're bringing you a series of three podcasts over three weeks or thereabouts, um, that's going to introduce you to our elected leaders on the local board. Um, today we've got Swanee Nelson. Uh, at our next one we're going to have uh, the amazing Topo Falau and then our elected chair, uh, Apulu, who will share with us um, his reflections, I guess, and um, his plans for the next um, period ahead. So the thing that makes these guys all stand out is that they are amazing in their own selves. They also all bring for us um, an incredible career. I mean, in Swanee's case, she had international leadership roles working in the NGO sector, but bringing um, her own little piece of Otara joy and delight and energy into the obviously into that, that area. She's brought all that home, which is incredible, home to Otara and home to share with us. So I'm not going to jump on her um, on her fanfare. I'm not going to jump on anything. I'm just going to go straight into our, a great discussion with Swanee Nelson, local board member for Otara Papatoitori. Kia ora. Kia ora and thank you, Judy, for having me on this podcast. I'm um, here in Otara, if you can see my t-shirt. Uh, ko whakatere te maunga, ko waima te awa, tuherangi raua ko tatara te marae, ngā tuki mu te whaoro te waka, uh, te mahurihuri te hapu, uh, no Otara ahau, ko swani toku ingoa. Uh, it's been, been awesome to uh, be on this podcast. Uh, I'm a... I like to say young, still young. <laughs> young Māori wahine born and bred here in Ōtara. I have two beautiful young children um, who also attend an amazing kura here in Ōtara. And I'm married to a wonderful man named Terry Nelson, who is also a kaimahi here in Ōtara. He's a career advisor at Tangaro College. And um, as you would know, I'm very, very proud uh, to be somebody who is born and bred and who lives and breathes the Ōtara way. And uh, it's been an absolute privilege over the past, I would say, two and a half decades um, doing mahi in my community and then transitioning out um, from being on the ground grassroots mahi to in the last three to four, well, now I'm in my second term, now serving on the Ōtara Papatūtui local board. Mm. And um, so that's where I'm at at the moment. I've done a lot through my life. I don't know how much you want to know. <laughs> oh, you let me know. know. All of it. Hey, what do we start from... Um Mum and Dad, were Mum and Dad born and bred here too? Did they come to Ōtara? Yes, so my parents, a, I guess you could say urban Māori, um, from the Napuhi, the far north, they moved down to Ōtara. Back in the days when Ōtara didn't have that much infrastructure, mm -hmm. if you remember back then, and then a lot of the, Ormiston wasn't even developed then, I still remember those days. It was still farmland. Mm -hmm. um, we still had things like in the town centre, there used to be, believe it or not, there used to be a water fountain in there, guys. And, Under the fish. Yeah, uh, in, inside the um, Ōtara town centre. So if mm -hmm. you go where Falsons is, yeah. Falsons is, there was a, it was like a pebble structure one. It was a good size one because as kids we liked to jump in there mm. when my parents were shopping in the town centre and just dip your feet. But I believe years later they got rid of it because of health and safety purposes. But I always think these yeah. days, Consistent. Like, yeah, we should bring that water fountain <laughs> yeah. back because it was a key feature. And I'm sure those who, who have been around there will remember that water fountain um, feature. Um, even back in the days then when we were young, my parents were quite heavy um, in sport. We used to play netball. 
Um, I was a lot younger then, but we had a Fano team. And believe it or not, before the markets were um, there, that used to be a netball court. Mm-hmm. And um, so we used to, it's, it's hard to even imagine that that used to happen, but you, we would turn up there and the whole of the back car park would be filled with netball teams playing netball in the Newbury car park. Um, so some amazing memories. My father we used to work on the power board, which is just around the back down here, um, moving towards what we now know as Highbrook. So he walked on the, the power board trucks and did a lot of mahi in the Otara community. And my mum, um, when we had moved down, she actually worked in the factories. So I remember a lot of her jobs. She went through a number of factories, but I remember growing up, one of them in particular, my mum used to punch um, holes into the buttons of jackets. Mm. My mum used to do that and she used to work the overnight shift hours and so sometimes I used to go to work with my mum in those factories. I, I wasn't working, but I'd just go with her to keep her company because she'd be one of the very few in that um, factory working. And I'd sit, literally sit and sleep in a pile of jackets. <laughs> It probably mm. wasn't allowed back then, but no one knew about it. So sorry to that company now. But I remember having these memories, sleeping in the jackets and my mum just like hearing this ch- chick for hours and hours so mm. my parents were very humble um workers who did the best that they can to provide you know a safe home and also food on the table a roof over our heads and ensuring we could have kai going to school every day doing these jobs growing up so i always mm. remember the amazing work ethic that my my whanau had growing up here in otara and that i guess a lot of that um the transfer over to me and the way that I run my household, how I treat my children, the values and the tikanga that we hold. And I guess a lot of the mahi that I do have been doing over the last two decades and continue to do here in Otara. Um, uh, for a number of time, I had moved through a, a number of different industries growing up, but um, I ended up finding myself always going back to community development and working with rangatahi. Mm-hmm. And I, I initially did that through my church. So um, I went to church very young, you know, in my life and was actually mentoring the rangatahi from the age of, when I was 18, I was mentoring like 10, 11, 12 year olds. Mm. So that's where my youth journey actually started, mentoring. Yeah, I guess that was going to be my next question. Yeah. So where did that sort of the, the surge to serve come from? That, that's where it started. Mm. You know, it actually started in the church. I attended mm. a church here in Clover Park um, and spent many of my years there actually, me, well, I guess you could call it mentoring, working with younger mm. children. And um, eventually over time, I think my I developed – certain things about me that I realized like compassion and empathy, mm-hmm. right? So any, anywhere there were spaces where um, I was able to put that into practice because I just had a love for people. Compassion and empathy just were always at the mm-hmm. forefront of what I did and I would be there. And so I remember a number of years as I got older, my first job actually was working for an international aid and development agency. Mm-hmm. And um, that so was... Had you done some training for that? Or that no, was just zero, you zero, zero. Yeah. I just landed wow. it. And I happened to have a... Um, I was going through some, you know, things in my life at that time. And a person in my church said, hey, I'm working for this amazing organization. Uh, organization, mm. she saw that I, I got, I guess I had really good work ethic. I was, was someone who could be trusted. And she said, How about I try and get your job there? And I, I got, she got me the job. Wow. And that's where actually I didn't go to, I didn't go to university. I didn't go tech. I actually dropped out of school in sixth form mm-hmm. and I went straight into the workforce. So what college were you at? I was at Auckland Girls. Yeah. Okay. A funny story about this, right? Because I went to Dawson Primary School. Then I went to what was, um, Clover Park at the time. It wasn't Kia ora, it was Clover mm. Park. I, I was one of the few new um, uh, students that were in the new Māori unit mm. that was developed back then. And then after that, my parents were like, oh, I'm not going to be sending you to this co-. The only college close to me was Tangaro College. <laughs> where my Tangaro mother college. was a guidance counsellor. Tangaro <laughs> College. And, you know, I had... And my Fano, like my parents took in a lot of my cousins growing up and a mm. lot of them, they, they went to Tangaro College and they were real mischief. So, mm. so I think my, my parents thought, oh, no, we ain't going to send you there. <laughs> and so, you know, they were like, no, nah, you're not going to go there. We're going to send you to Auckland Girls. And at that time, there was a high number of actual um, parents that were sending their daughters that were living in Otara and Clover Park to Auckland Girls. I was Mm. one of them. We all used to catch the bus, the 497, 457, everyone knows those buses. Mm. And we bust every day 
to Auckland girls and back. How long did it take? Man, it was a journey, like an hour. But then when you got to the city, you've got to walk from yeah. Simon Street. You got to pass all of those unsavory um, buildings, if you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. As you get closer to the end, halfway through K Road, <laughs> so those are the things I got exposed to. Um, um, but for, really funny, they're like, oh no, we don't want you to go there and we don't want you to date a boy there. And a few years later, I ended up uh, meeting an amazing guy. I married him and he was a Tangaroa college student. <laughs> and he, he literally went back to pursue his dream job. Um, and now he's the careers advisor at Tangaroa college. Mm. So isn't that amazing how, um, life kind of does that? Yeah. I just can't avoid TC. So yeah, I've just embraced it now. <laughs> um, so yeah. So those five years, the organization was amazing. It's called Tear Fund and they do a lot of amazing work in third world mm. countries across the world. I spent five years of my life, like actually learning life and learning, um, skills that you'd probably learn at college, uh, unit, university and tech. Um, got to travel the world as well. So I think that's another thing that early, early on formed the way that I was at a very young age, I was fortunate to travel to third world countries, spent a lot of time, um, you wouldn't believe it, actually auditing projects between mm-hmm. the ages of 22 to 25. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember spending like... Auditing a, Kiwi projects or international projects? International projects. projects. Yeah. So I remember um, one of the travels that I did at that very young age was I spent like a month in Mexico. I started mm-hmm. at the top and I traveled all the way down to the borders of Guatemala, checking all the projects that we had been financially contributing to. And mm-hmm. I was sponsoring a child too at the same time. At that young age. So I got mm. to visit the um, child and meet the family that I'd been sponsoring wow. for those years. And mm. it's kind of, you know, kind of weird. I don't know if it's weird when you think about it now that um, at those ages and like, I kind of, when I reflect back on my life, like, oh my goodness, like at that age, I was doing quite adult things, mature things. But I think a lot of that had to do with the people I was surrounding myself with at the time. But also mum and dad and their Mum and dad, yeah. Kid, yeah. Church influences and yeah. the workplace that I was in, which mm. was very much compassion work driven, yeah. So that actually set the tone mm. for where I am. It really mm. did where I am now. And I loved it. And I got to move through a lot of different other spaces um, in community and youth development. Um, you know, I became an executive for an amazing organization called IOSIS mm. Family Trust, which is in Manurewa, and they do amazing work around supervised contact and working with families and counseling. Um, during that time, I became a Vodafone World of Difference recipient, mm. and they paid for me to actually work and create projects in Otara. So for about two years, um, there was an existing trust. They put me as the CEO, mm. and um, I worked to help build the capabilities of that trust we were based in the Clover Park Community House back then but we were running amazing um, performing arts programs out of OMAC and out of the um, the REC during that time wow. yeah and when I look back at those photos I think oh my goodness you know it's it's wonderful to see that, that I was after Paulie though that was after Paulie yes yeah yes yes so, so what an amazing kind of yeah, it was, foundation to be building. From. Yeah, it was yeah. you know, you know, all of that stuff, and it was called mm. Canopy Trust, Care and Nurture mm. Pacific Youth. That was the name of the trust back then, and um, and then through then it just moved into other things. You know, I ended up working for another amazing organisation called Amped. So Amped go into different parks all around South Auckland, mm. and they try and activate those areas for young people who are just frequent those spaces and move wow. them into leadership programs. So at mm. the time, council didn't have a, um, a youth leadership program. So mm. I actually designed the one that they used. Um, mm. And you'll know some of that work today because some of it still exists through the breakaway programs, mm-hmm. all of those things. So I was there right at the beginning of those. Uh, and and it just moved on to things. So you can, there was a, like a whole range of things I was doing. And one day, me and my husband were sitting down there and we had this epiphany. We were like, you know what, we're doing so much. Like it's so much good work and it's awesome. But we just wanted to take a step back and like let's just focus on our backyards. Mm. And – this is where our neighbourhood s- stuff actually happened. We actually said, I stepped out of the organisations I was working with, um, which were amazing organisations, but all the focus was around South Auckland. And I just wanted to focus on Otara because there was mm. so much happening at that yeah. time. So uh, much so much opportunity, but so much needed. Yeah, well. so much mm. needed. And I felt, and there was amazing people doing stuff, but in my, my mind, I thought, you know what, I've been able to develop these skills and these connections and these networks. Mm. I can use these to benefit and put back into my community. And yeah. ex- and that was the 
premise at the time and my husband fully supported it because we're like-minded and so this is where your entrepreneurial endeavor create was created yeah yeah i mean the licensing stuff was such a critical thing that was happening my husband Mm. had been working in the youth development space for years and so Mm. when he was working with the young people he was like you know all these young people to get to independence a lot quicker there's tohu you need right Mm. cvs id blah 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 but the licensing was an issue and if you look at the road code it's like 400 plus pages that you've got to comprehend to pass Mm. the learner license test Mm -hmm. and all the rangatahi that my husband were working with and i was they just you know, they wouldn't sit down, digest that or go through things. And a lot were failing. And so we took the road code and over about a year, we've redeveloped it to create a curriculum that helps Māori Pacifica to digest, comprehend and pass it a lot easier. And that's yeah. how Let's Get Legal and see got developed. Yeah. yeah. And it was a free resource that we put out. So those things were happening. But when we wanted to focus back on Otara, it was like, what's the best thing we could do? And it was like, connect neighbours. Yeah. connect. So we started with our street. We just started with us and yeah. we came official street leaders. <laughs> we made ourselves, so nobody fast, nominated us, by the way. <laughs> so nobody, we just made ourselves a yeah. street leader and it literally or stepped up, I think. Stepped up, I guess yeah. stepped up. And the quickest way I knew strategies and I said, look, we know, we've got access to bread. This is actually how it started, guys. We had access to bread because we were supporting families. We're like, mm. now let's take that bread and we're going to knock on our neighbours' doors mm. and offer bread to our neighbours. And that's how and be it started. Be intentional about Be intentional, yeah. 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 So we'd just knock mm. on our neighbours' doors, literally every single door, and be like, hi, neighbour, my name is Swanee, this is my husband, Terry, and we just wanted to give you guys some bread. We've got some resources here and let us know if you need any help. Mm. That's how it started. And then um, after a year, like through that period of time, we were just trying to find, you know, what's what things are happening in Otara that our neighbours don't know about that we mm. can make aware to our neighbours, you know, and some of them. Like there was this amazing Marakai initiative. Um, mm. Unfortunately, the organisation is operating anymore. But what they did at the time, which many people don't know about, is they were offering free um, garden setups. You mm. got all of the soil, startup seedlings, and they provided you with a mentor for a whole year. So we set that up in our street and um, we went around, you know, we had to go knock on our neighbours' doors first and said, who's interested in this? And a high number of them did. And so things like that, like looking what's available, what would give our whānau value and what do they need in trying to connect those dots and make it available to them. So a lot of those things happened and, you know, even if we called meetings with our street, only some would come because some people aren't the type of people that want to socialise, right? Um, and so one year we thought, shall we try and do something a bit different? Let's do street lights, Christmas street lights. Mm. I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, so- the Christmas street yeah. lights. And we had no money. Uh, you know what? We had nothing. We had zero. But we, by that stage, we were so well connected with our street and all the youth on our street were like, like, they loved us. So we are like, let's get all the young people because um, they finish school usually around October, November, right? Mm. It's like they've got nothing to do from here. What if we made it a project? And thankfully at work, they all jumped on board and we started doing these videos like rallying support, like does anybody want to donate, you know, lights to us? And we sent like mails out to trade me, lots of people saying, we've got nothing. Can you guys give us solar lights? And had to be solar because – You know, power, like, you know, many of the houses on my street were beneficiaries. So we needed to make sure that we weren't going to do things that were going to increase their bills. So solar power was the way to go. Oh, and there were those Mercury handouts of free light bulbs and lights. Yep, but that came afterwards. Yeah, And what I've always learned with community-led projects is Mm. don't overthink things, just start. Just do it. Just do it because eventually what happens is people see like, oh, they're mobilised, they've got people believe in it. They're actually trying to make an effort. I'm going to get behind that. And I've seen it. I've seen it happen every single time throughout all the years I've done this. Like, and I always tell people that you don't have to have the full picture. Just start with what you have. It may not be what you want in the first year, but you stick with it. Be consistent. It'll grow and grow. And that's what happened with the streetlights. First year, we only had like a quarter of Cooper Crees. By the second year, we had over 30,000 people come to Otara. The congestion, through the streets and the town centre was absolutely crazy. It was, we couldn't believe it. The, our point of defence was like, 
we tapped into our cultural capital. Like we've got amazing cooks and you'd come down the street and only see not only see lights, you'd also be able to stop and get like Tonga food, Cook Island food, hangies. You had like different musicians. You had our churches, you know, from all over the place mm. playing on the corners. It was incredible. And still to this day, it's an amazing event. We had a... We had to take a break the year before because of COVID, but mm. we brought it back last year again, restarted wow. it. And it's just been one of those amazing community-led kaupapa that have been, I don't know, just, it's just, it's one of a kind day. Eh? Did you see an opportunity to like help people with food and safety, health and safety measures like, you know, food handling certification and things like that could be a platform for more learning? Um, so um, we're quite lucky because a high number of the group, uh, the residents on our street mm. actually have their own startup businesses. Mm. We've got coffee cart owners and there's a new one called Tumiki Kai mm. and they all have those things. But um, if you understand how the health and safety food handling um, laws work, you can actually run one to three or oh, up to three fundraisers for free without those certificates per annum okay, as so a fundraiser. Yeah, just have some best practice around food handling. There is, yeah, yeah. and and generally, mm. like you know, when we go around, like uh, a lot of those families that are doing those things, someone does oversee it. They're not new to fundraisers, mm-hmm. so you know it's a regular. So wearing gloves and all those things, they do do that. Yeah, but then to a degree, we don't micromanage certain things because no. legally, well, it takes a lot out of it. Too, that's so. right. Yeah. So I'm hearing you this, and just coming back that your advice. For someone, you know, for local Otarians, setting something up in that vision that you really strongly put together was that, you know, stay grassroots, be consistent and just keep yeah. on going even when nothing appears to be happening first, but create that groundswell. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, I think, you know, like it's great. We've got um, well-resourced organisations and We've got, you know, as his local board in certain places that need to be doing their roles. But there's just some things that we can't do that only community can do. Mm. And, and an example I want to use is I've recently been following a small group from Otara, just a family who mm. started this thing called Pataka Kai for Animals. Mm. I don't know if you've seen that. Now it's a new initiative. Kind of do it. Yeah, based version of that. Yeah, and yeah. all they do is they they it's a whānau mm. here in Otara. They've only just come out recently. They are not funded, mm. and they they've just been resourceful and just saw a need. They're like, you know, in Otara, um, we love our animals. Mm. <laughs> Some need to you know get support to pay for registration and all of that kind of stuff and, food. and other things. Yeah. But you know, like if if we're struggling to feed our own selves and our our children, then of course, you know, the animals are just going to leave there. And they saw this need and I've been following it and to see the response from the community and how many people they've been actually mm. helping in the community. There's no one else doing that here no. in Otara right now. No. Only this family. And that's, that's what I mean. I was just saying, you didn't need to be resourced or mobilised. You just needed to have, like, see a need and try something, put it, put yourself mm. out there and do Nothing it. Nothing one-on-one actually, but but sometimes people don't have the background of learning marketing. So you're here exactly. to share, share that with us. That's wonderful. Born and raised here in Otara, I've I've seen how Otara was when I was young, the infrastructure, the issues, the challenges, the resourcing, what my family, my parents went through, what my own children are going through um, to where we are right now. And before I, I hopped on a local board and, you know what, I never ever thought I would actually, I never actually aspired or even considered being in a space like this. Totally big, I never, I mm. never, this was never ever part of my career goals or my future aspiration to be sitting in this space. Mm. And um, it just so happened, you know, a three three years ago, someone said, I think it might be useful for you to be here because you've done a lot in the community. Mm. And I was like, oh, I don't know, you know. And I, I was really picky to the local board because I, you know, when you see these challenges, why, why are we not getting upgrades in our playgrounds like mm. all the other areas? How come our town centre still hasn't been revitalised? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why are our young people still not getting the bottom of the barrel when it comes to resourcing? Yet we look over here, they've been funded for this, this, mm. this, this, this. Why are there more pedestrian crossings on these time? Why aren't there more pedestrian crossings? Why does Beds Road down the end still have pot roll, uh, potholes, you know, and mm. people are – 
they use, especially around our area, their mobility scooters. There's no way they could use that. It's been fixed since then, by the way, guys. You know, but all these questions and, you know, I used to just think, man, they do nothing, you know? Like, what are they doing, you know, in these mm. roles? Then I became fortunate to become, <laughs> well, fortunate, but I become a local board of mayor. Yeah. <laughs> Came a local board member in the last mm. term. And can I say what a huge learning that has been to see how things actually work on the other side. Um, the amount of challenges that are faced sitting as a board member here when you're having to try and advocate and push to the governing body that – uh, to have an equity lens over the way funds are distributed out to our local boards and having to convince them and having governing body members, majority of them, choose to vote or go another way mm. is very difficult, even when you strongly advocate. You know, we've got an ama- incredible chair. If you see the things that he says and advocates in the background he is a strong chair but we're up Mm. against a lot of challenges you know and that's why it's really important that when our community are voting for roles like amir governing body members in different areas you really need to get out and vote because at the end of the day even though we may advocate for things if a majority feels no we're going to vote this way they're going to vote that way and we're going to still be left in these things. Yeah. This year we've got some big um, things happening with um, the new proposed Auckland plan, which mm-hmm. I'm sure our chair will talk about. Um, we're about to adopt, you know, our new local board plan. We've just had a cyclone. You know, we're mm-hmm. already in debt with council and there are a number of things that they're wanting to cut, including community funding and grants mm-hmm. and even um, access to our local services. So like libraries would be reduced. There's a number of things. So On one, the CAB. Oh, a lot. So one mm-hmm. of the challenges like I found sitting in this role is how can we get our community to be more involved to in those processes, to bother mm-hmm. to read the things that come out when they're mm. cons- you know, doing consults, because if you look at the paperwork, it's just not, it's very mm. exhaustive. It can be very like difficult to understand. And when we're not giving feedback to those, it actually impacts, you know, the decisions yeah. that are being made. So that's an area that still needs to be worked on. Um, and my hope and my, my word is always up to local residents is, if you see anything that says we need your feedback on things, whether it's to do with our local board, your schools, um, our Auckland plan, as boring as it may sound, like give time to it because it's going to impact you. It's going to impact your children. It's going to impact infrastructure. It's going to impact your life. It really mm-hmm. is. So the consultation on the budget, we know it opened on Monday. Yes. Public consultation. The duration is until? So we do, good question. I've, I've literally just got the local board plan here in my book. So <laughs> okay. I think we'll get, we'll get, um, Reese to extend on that because we've just got given those books yesterday and the, yeah. it's only just gone out. So there's a lot to read through. So but what does the process of the public consultation look like? So. Apart from- Clicking on the link on the yeah. Website. So we're getting ready to host some community consultations. Mm. We've done this in the past where we usually go out to Tepuki or our libraries and so forth. So those are being scheduled right now. Mm. Um, as you know, we've got things like Polyfest coming up. Um, so one of the good things that the our local board um, is doing this year is we're actually engaging the community to do those consultations. Mm. So Rangatahi will actually consult to Rangatahi um, sports groups will consult to sports groups and they'll do that in the most appropriate way that works for them and we resource them to do that as well um the other thing too again is we've got hard copies not everybody's on digital you know devices and using that um as we did in the last term and we're going to do it this term and is ensure that all of that com is translated into all our pacifica and maori languages Mm. that's always been a thing as well and so those are just a couple of the things that are coming up so just thinking about infrastructure there, because that sounds like a really solid comms infrastructure. This is my last question. I yes. <laughs> um, would you leverage that for the census engagement as well? Because that sounds like a really solid model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
there's a lot of things aside from that that can be, you know, leveraged. Again, it's a little bit more complex than that, but I know um, our chair will be able to actually expand on that really well because he's been in a lot mm. of um, conversations over this week, the past week, and there's mm. again, there's a lot of new things happening in this new governing body in our mayor and the way that they're wanting to direct things is going to yeah. influence that. And there are a lot of things that we're still unaware of because yeah. of that. Um, so I think reserve that question for the chair because I think you're okay. going to get a, a really good beefy response mm. from what you'll have to say there and more. That's great. Yeah. Hey, Sonny, it was great to talk no, to you. No, thank what, you. What we always say about these podcasts is that, you know, you and I have never spoken for more than 15, probably no more than 10 minutes even. Yeah. And so it's a real lovely opportunity to sit down and get to know some real stuff. Yeah. So it's exciting and I really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. I'm glad I finally got to come in. Yes. (laughs)